Good afternoon. Welcome to INSA's Workplace Safety in the IC, the New Normal panel. I now like to play a video from our sponsor, GuideHouse. This is GuideHouse. We work side by side with our commercial and public sector clients to address their most important challenges by advancing strategic thinking and building trust in society. Our national security segment transforms our nation's greatest emergency management, homeland security, diplomatic, law enforcement, and intelligence community challenges into opportunities. We work side by side with federal agencies to optimize mission operations by defining a vision for the future, a strategy to achieve it, and a plan to measure impact. The future of consulting lives here. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our workplace safety in the IC, navigating the new normal. We have an outstanding lineup of speakers today for this very timely conversation. Before we begin, I'd like to share a couple of housekeeping notes. If you'll note a box on the right-hand corner of your screen, it's for questions. I would encourage you to ask questions and identify both yourself and your organization before doing so. I'd also like to remind everyone that this event is on the record and open to the press and will be available on our website tomorrow following today's program. And finally, I would like to thank our two sponsors. First off, GuideHouse and one of our newest members, ServiceNow, for their support of this program. We could not deliver this type of virtual content without their sponsorship. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Neff, a partner at GuideHouse, who will in turn introduce our moderator. Thanks again for joining us today. And again, I encourage you to provide questions to the moderator during the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, today's topic is likely weighing heavily on all of our minds as we balance between getting back to normal and keeping our workforce safe. Um, bringing together the public and private sector to share insights and experiences is critical as we move forward. Um, and that's why GuideHouse is a proud INSA member and supports their efforts in keeping us connected during these challenging times. Um, GuideHouse is supporting multiple government and commercial clients and they're planning to get back to the office or whatever that may look like going forward and helping them determine what the work environment was that will actually look like. The IAC obviously has some very unique challenges in this area and that's why we are happy to sponsor this session and this conversation. I'm pleased to introduce our panel moderator, John Doyen. Uh, INS is Vice President, Executive Vice President in this position. Um, he provides strategic oversight of INSA Council's policy initiatives and programming. Uh, a career national security executive, executive, he joined INSA in March of 2020. So, John, over to you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to Guide Health for your support of this program. And joining me today uh, for this session is an incredible lineup of speakers. I'm pleased to introduce them now. We have Mr. Randy Fofi who is Director of Installation Operations at NGA. Uh, joining him is John McDermott, who is an Emergency Management Specialist for the State Department's Intelligence and Research Bureau. We have Janine Callahan, who is a member of INSA's Advisory Committee and is also Vice President of Corporate Operations for Plus Three IT Systems. And we have joining us Rich Lambert, who is Vice President of Enterprise Services and CIO at Northrop Grumman Mission Systems. So I'm pleased to have all of you here with us today to share your insights and expertise. And uh, let's go ahead and get, get it kicked off. You know, as, as returning employees to the workplace um, during and after the pandemic won't be as simple as announcing a reopening or return to the workplace date uh, and carrying on business as usual. Today's conversation will look at how organizations of all sizes across our community are looking at this new landscape, what's working, what needs to be re-examined, and what issues remain to be addressed. 
So to start the discussion, let's take a look at what some of the top issues are. Uh, and we'll turn to you, Randy. Uh, and as you look at this question from the perspective of NGA, uh, what do you see as the biggest issue facing reopening of the workplace today? The biggest issue that, that well, first we did reopen last mon uh, Monday with 25% of the workforce and on the 29th intend to go to 50% of the workforce. So here in the DC area in our building of 10,000, right now we're at 2,500 people. Um, to go to 5,000 in a couple of weeks. The biggest issue is the anxiety of the people that have been home for a couple of months now, coming back in, all the concerns they had. So our commitment to them is to provide them a, a safe and secure workspace and to reassure them that it's a safe and secure workspace. So we've done that through town halls, communications. We hand out brochures to employees as they return for the first time so they know what to see. We're doing temperature taking as they walk in the door to again reassure them uh, from that perspective um signs for social distancing we have signs everywhere with limitations on elevators conference rooms uh, lines on the floor arrows on the floor and we published for the workforce our cleaning schedule our cleaning policies how we clean what we clean we've put hand sanitizer by anything you have to touch the keypads to get in, elevators, et cetera. So we think we've put together uh, an atmosphere that will relieve the anxiety so that they can come in and be comfortable. Uh, beyond that, it will be enforcing all the above. Uh, we've issued face masks to all occupants of the building, whether NGA or not, and we have an, a face mask policy to, to enforce that. So that's what we're doing at NGA, among other things. Well, thank you. It sounds like a, a comprehensive uh, approach that you have. Uh, look, looking uh, to you, John, what, what is happening over at State Department? Um, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, at State Department, we started our phase one yesterday. Um, so we can uh, scale up from anywhere from zero to 40%. Um, and INR, one of our biggest challenges is just making sure that we're meeting the needs of our employees, which is multifaceted as well. Things from childcare to uh, those that are identified uh, either as self high risk or someone in their immediate household that's high risk. Um, the need to have flexible schedules, flexible hours because of, of those uh, special needs. And then uh, something that Randy had touched on is just the anxiety. They've been home for so long and they're trying to come back into an environment that they hadn't been in for almost three months now. Um, and just the, the idea of coming back to work and what that all entails, as well as how to get back to work, especially, you know, we have um, about 45% of our folks rely on the Metro and the DC Metro is doing maintenance and taking down some of the stations, some of the lines. So to try to bring back our workforce, we're having to try to address parking issues, again, going off of that workforce flexibility um, and then just the overall um, things that are going on in the facilities with the, the face coverings um, and the different uh, PP and E that we have in the facilities and what's expected when you're in the building because those that have been in the building for this time have established a new routine that these folks haven't been used to. So we've been communicating uh, through various town halls weekly as well as sending out situation reports and making sure that we're sharing all department notices and just making sure that everyone is aware as well as being able to present questions to our leadership to help them feel more informed and more relaxed as they look at transitioning back to coming back to the building. And those are just some of the things we're doing at State as well. Yeah, I think communications with the workforce really is uh, central to uh, how we all approach this this issue, and and INSA is glad to be a part of that communications uh, in a in in a in some way. Um, turning to you, Janine, I'm curious uh, with your company, uh, you know, what are the challenges you face? Um, thanks, John, and thanks again to INSA for kicking off this very important conversation. Um, as it's relevant to how sort of we've approached. Um, COVID workplace safety. I just like to describe Plus3IT for uh, just a moment. We are um, 
we are a cloud services company with the DOD and the intelligence community and, and other federal customers. We're also under 100 employees, so I think that's highly relevant. Um, mm -hmm. Most of us are in the NCR, uh, although not our entire work workforce. Approximately 20% of our employees were designated mission essential and have been working on site um, throughout the duration. Um, and our corporate offices are in Reston, Virginia. So those are just some um, aspects of, you know, that make um, our response kind of relevant there. Um, so I would say that um, while uh, we had a strong um, infrastructure culture and policies around telework to start, mm -hmm. and those were, have been super helpful for us, um, both in terms of our response early on and as we look to reopening, right? So for, for us, um, you know, some of our biggest challenges have been, um, you know, information flow, right? And just um, information coming um, from, you know, workplace safety and um, public health information coming from OSHA and the CDC. Um, we also were looking at um, critical information that was flowing to us um, from our prime contractors, um, information about their own corporate policies that they were flowing to us as a subcontractor, as well as information they were conveying from our customers. Um, we also, um, for our folks on site, are getting daily operational guidance um, about um, seating and distancing, and, and these things are dynamic and they, they change daily. So for, for my team um, at the corporate level, Pulling all that, making sure we're we're right at the nexus of all that information, that we can pull it all together, um, synthesize it, assess the impact on current processes and procedures, and get that information out in a way that also ensures, um, you know, good information security, right? Kind of balancing um, that information out. Um, I think that has been. Um, you know, really a, a key challenge for us, making sure that we can can meet the information needs, and all of that goes to the comments that um, you know the um, that Randy and and John have mentioned about about the stress and anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. That that uh, our folks are feeling, and I would say that um, one of the second order challenges we're starting to see around that is not just the individual stress and anxiety. But we're starting to get a sense that the workplace is very tense for our folks um, mm -hmm. in some of our customer spaces. Um, we're getting, um, you know, in some ways it's a little bit of a little gal of humor, but there's a lot of discussion about walking on eggshells and having to be super mindful of the level of tension that everyone is trying to struggle with this new coming uh, to this new normal. And so we're actually also looking at ways that we can provide some tools and techniques so that our folks, when they're on site, feel like they can kind of work in that environment, stay productive and not let the let that tension in the air um, impact their productivity. Thanks for those insights. And I, I know um, just from visiting my local grocery store in the first week, uh, the employee's uh, mood uh, was, was pretty positive, but as the, the time has gone on, the, you can see the stress building. And I think that's a big, uh, issue that uh, companies and organizations all need to address and address forthright because uh, it's it's real and it's something that's really important. Um, I want to turn as well now to to Rich Lambert from Northrop Grumman and Rich uh, I think you know uh, uh, one of your fellow uh, Northrop Grumman uh, uh, seniors um, uh, was the catalyst to getting this uh, program on uh, scheduled and on the air. So we want to thank uh, Jennifer Wallsmith for that. Mm -hmm. But tell us, uh, so, you know, uh, in contrast to Janine and a smaller uh, company doing work for the IC, uh, Northrop's one of the big, the big companies. Uh, what are the challenges that you see there at Northrop? Yeah, thanks, John. And again, yeah, I appreciate the, the shout out for Jennifer. And, uh, and so from a Northrop perspective, I mean, we have through, through this, we have remained sort of open. I mean, our facilities have remained open uh, for the most part uh, through this whole, you know, kind of business um, assessment of the virus and continuity, et cetera. Now we have moved a fair amount of our people into a telework uh, environment, but for our manufacturing staff and folks that are working in a classified or restricted space, they have maintained, um, a readiness and, a, and an ability to support the mission. Um, so that's been very important for us. And as we think about, you know, entering a phase where more employees are returning on site, I would say some of the challenges that we're looking at really are around just maintaining 
our priority, which is the, the health and the safety of our employees and the safety of our workforce operations. And balancing that with our commitment to the mission has really been the key. Um, but again, we, we haven't seen a lot of disruption in our business because we have maintained um, you know, our facilities open throughout, um, given the dedication for our teams. So. Well, thank you for that. And um, um, thinking about all of the, the things that uh, each of you do in the workplace and just your daily operations, um, as employees start to come back, um, are you know? Are you, uh, you know? How are you adjusting uh, your operations because of of the uh, COVID? And um, what are the, you know? Do you have anything that you've you've tried hasn't worked, or you have perhaps a best practice you would want to share, want to share, or uh, something else related to how you're really working to implement some new policies in the workplace? And uh, why don't we start with? Uh, uh, let's go to Janine for that one. Thanks, John. So um, again, I would say that um, our existing um, telework infrastructure, including all the policies and procedures and equipment that our folks have, has really been a blessing. Um, we actually have been able to to pivot quite easily um, from uh, to to 100% remote work for any of our staff that are not required to be on staff. Um, I would say that I would really commend our our technical team leads who worked very closely with our customers, our cores, um, for to coming up with unclassified work plans for the majority of our folks so that we were able to continue to bill. That was a huge um, effort on everyone's part and it really has made a, a tremendous difference in terms of our folks being able to stay productive. Um, and as a small business, that mattered a lot that we were able to keep our folks um, mm -hmm. effectively employed. Um, I would say that regarding our facility, again, we have um, about 5,000 square feet in Reston, so you know, nowhere near what you're dealing with, Rich, or, or any of you actually. But we did um, go in and reconfigure. We went on a capacity basis, so we went in, we measured, we uh, reduced capacity to a very uh, small um, amount that we felt um, could provide adequate physical distancing, not just um, for um, folks that are actually would be seated, but also for movement around the space um, to make sure that people could pass um, uh, safely between each other. Um, we posted um, capacity limits like in the kitchens and places like that. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, one thing that we we did do um, as we in advance before we opened up is um, I actually did a video walkthrough. Um, we kind of all jumped on. Um, uh, a Google Meet, I turned my camera on, I walked around with my phone, um, I walked uh, in and was able uh, to show what changes our building management had made to the lobby area and all of that. Um, one way um, stairways, you know, limiting um, the number of folks on elevators and in restrooms. So I was able to kind of give folks a visual view and then I went into our offices. I showed where we have kind of the health check-in place um, where we were posting capacity limits and um and we got really good feedback on that people felt very reassured that they mm -hmm. knew what to expect um when they when they decided to to take advantage but i will say that we have been really um kind of beating the mantra of you're safer at home so to the extent yeah. that you do not have to come into the office um, we're encouraging folks to to stay telework um stay working remotely helping to communicate with your employees through being able to share those those videos of, of the workplace uh, i think that's a really good good idea and uh, uh, hopefully others can can do something similar um, but with this the stay at home of course that gets to the issue of telework and i'm curious um, uh, how telework has changed for some of our organizations uh, and uh, maybe randy i'll go over to you with with nga um, um, to what degree do you have you been able to uh, perhaps expand your use of telework, and uh, do you think that's going to stick uh, as we go forward? So we expanded it exponentially because, as an intelligence organization, ninety percent of what our employees do is on the high side, as they say, the, the TS network. It's not necessarily classified, but the work occurs there even personnel actions, et cetera. So to put people on telework, the agency 
uh, did two things. They, they literally issued a CAC reader to every employee in the agency. So everybody could log on and they created, I'm not a technical guy, a method for us to get into our unclass network uh, at NGA. And then they migrated all that was not classified down to the unclassified network. So it, it, it was quite surprising. We were able to really continue a lot uh, of our work through telework. Um, there are certain things you cannot do. So those are the people that stayed in the agency or would have to go into the agency a day or two or spend half a day um, to do things on the high side, as we say. So I think telework is, has been very successful. Um, we actually had complaints that telework was more stressful for employees because they're never really off the clock. They feel wow. obligated to always be in front of their computer. And uh, and we do see things sticking. The, the admiral, the director of the agency, has, you know, this, I guess the, the word in both today is reimagine, reimagine the agency and, and use this experience to, to identify what we can use for telework um, and how we can exploit that for things like uh, our constraints on parking, our constraints on office space, et cetera. So within my organization, we are doing that. And as we go to 100%, we will go to 100% in the, uh, of the workforce coming back, and we have a schedule to do that. But to relieve the pressure, uh, we will incorporate telework to, to be able to socially distance when we are back at 100%. So... Yeah, surprise, surprisingly good experience for the intelligences. Great. Hey, I want to uh, shift and take a question from the audience right now. And I will remind everyone that um, you can submit questions for the speakers in, using the questions box uh, to the right side of your screen. And um, this question uh, asks about um, visitors to your facility. and. Uh, uh, the question is, will you require visitors to provide personal information that will enable contact tracing? So this gets to the subject of really trying to screen and monitor not just your employees, but also perhaps screening and monitoring uh, visitors. Uh, 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 how would you be able to collect this data uh, and use it? And, and uh, Rich, you're a large organization. Maybe uh, Northrop's been looking at that, lots of visitors. Uh, how are you tackling that challenge? Yeah, thanks, John. So, um, so I think from from our perspective, we we put together a, a visitor questionnaire that basically asks some very basic questions of the person. That, and first of all, we try to minimize visitors during you know during the initial phases, so we kept the population to a manageable level. But for those that did come in, they filled out a basic questionnaire. But we did not collect anything that would be considered um, personal information. We're not storing any personal information, et cetera. It was really just in terms of where they had traveled, um, were they uh, fever free, had they taken their temperature, were they symptomatic in any way? And so um, that was the extent, and we still follow that process now. Thank you. And um, uh, along the lines of screening and monitoring, I know, uh, Randy, I heard you talk about taking temperatures. Uh, is that a common uh, practice right now? Uh, John, are you doing that at State Department? For visitors, we are. Um, we have a questionnaire as well. We, we ask that they, uh, whoever the host is, provide the questions um, with basically the same thing, or asking about travel. Um, have they been symptomatic or have they experienced any of these uh, symptoms over the last couple of days? Um, they are, uh, their temperature has to be below 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when they uh, arrive on the day of, of the meeting, um, they would get temperature screened again to ensure um, at the visitor center to, to ensure that they don't have a, a high temperature. And then the uh, questionnaire is re-asked to them to ensure that their answers still match what they had submitted. And at the State Department, too, even in phase one, we are only doing official visitors only approved at the mm -hmm. assistant secretary level and discouraging unofficial visitors at this time. Yeah. Is there also, John, routine screening of employees each day when they arrive to work? So there's no screening of the employees other than every employee is recommended to take their temperature before coming to the workplace. And if they are sick, whether it's strep, whether it's any anything that feels off, they are encouraged not to come into work uh, during that day because we know strep is going around. Um, it could be anything, but 
just because you have the sniffles, everyone's going to assume and it's going to put people in an awkward position. So we encourage that if you're not feeling well at all, to please stay home. Hmm. Interesting. So um, here's another question we have in from one of our listeners. Um, you know, and it gets to the, the point of employees and stress and anxiety and worry. And that is, you know, how do you deal with an employee who really just doesn't feel like they can can go back to the workplace until we perhaps have a vaccine or there's, uh, you know, we're beyond uh, uh, the concern that they could could catch this disease. How do you how do you deal with someone who basically refuses to come back to work? I don't know, Randy, have have uh, you had anybody at NGA uh, in that category yet? I'm not sure if we've had a person. They have put out the policy, though. And uh, the first, the supervisor should, as much as possible, provide telework for the employee. But when we get to a point where it's safe to come in and we direct employees to come in and they refuse uh, OPM type policy, they'll have to take annual leave to stay home if they, they don't feel safe coming in. That was just sent out again recently. So, um, but going back to folks, to, to encourage people to stay home that have the sniffles or a little bit of a fever, um, in this stage, we allow them to use weather and safety leave because mm -hmm. they don't have to come in to get their hours. So, but if they if they do refuse to come in once we think we're safe, it, it's, they'll, have, they'll have to use annual leave. So when people uh, do come to visit or employees or anyone in the workplace, um, uh, one of the questions is, uh, uh, is there gonna be hand sanitizer available? Or are there gonna be masks available? Um, or are there gonna be wipes available for my keyboard and my workspace and wherever there might be a common area? Um, what kind of a, a supplies uh, do you, you plan to have on, on hand, such as you know, PPE or, or other types of equipment? Um, and is that the, you know, is that the employer's uh, responsibility to provide that, or is that a burden on the employee? And um, why don't we have to go ahead and ask uh, uh, Rich to, to take that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, and as I mentioned in the beginning, in terms of my remarks, I mean, our the safety of, of our employees and the, and the safety of our work operations is, you know, been our top priority. So maintaining a clean and disinfected kind of environment for those that have been coming in has been a key. And we have been able to do that. Um, uh, and so the short answer is, you know, we do provide all the cleaning supplies that are necessary for common areas and, uh, and, and, and locations where employees would be congregating. And again, we're managing that in terms of uh, guidance around how many employees should be in conference rooms and as you know, maintaining social distancing in terms of the cafeterias that we do have open, et cetera. But, uh, but we are uh, putting a regular emphasis on cleaning and disinfection. Okay. And um, let's pivot. Here's a, a good question. You know, returning to work uh, for many people means returning to a work role where you um, are required to do a lot of travel. And so this is a travel question, and that is, you know, at what point do you begin to authorize and permit work-related travel to resume, and and what conditions um, uh, will will affect or drive that decision? And um, uh, maybe John will ask you, you know, is that something that the State Department has been uh, uh, looking at? So the State Department right now, with the travel guidance, is based on um, the the either the host country or or where the destination is. Uh, right now, it's only mission critical travels that should be going on, uh, which uh, has to be approved at certain levels. And then um, you fall into different categories of uh, potentially being in, having to be in self-isolation either when you get there or upon returning, uh, which has really affected some of our PCS travel for the summer and mm -hmm. things like that. So it's, uh, as we're going into phase one and as some of our overseas posts are going into phase one or phase two, um, it's all being uh, directed uh, based off of State Department's travel guidance that they're, they're constantly updating as needed uh, through our internal and external uh, sites. Okay. 
Hey, um, I'll ask um, both Randy and Rich the same question. You're large organizations. You've got multiple locations uh, around uh, the country and, and uh, around the world even. Um, how are you addressing the issue of you know, uh, work-related travel for people who that's been a common part of their, their um, you know, regular uh, work duties? And we'll start with Randy. So that, uh, that, that one for NGA is kind of in flux. Um, currently, the leadership of NGA, if anyone flies, they have to self-quarantine for two weeks. Mm. And that is not necessarily in line with other government agencies. And we've struggled because we do have a split headquarters between St. Louis and here. For example, half my workforce is in St. Louis. And you typically travel back and forth every month. So basically, it's a freeze on travel. Uh, we had to bring a critical employee from St. Louis to here. And we had to have that employee drive because if he flew, he would have gotten a two-week stay in the embassy suites in Springfield under the government, but uh, that wouldn't be efficient use of his time. So, so I don't think we've, we've really come to grips with how we're going to tra uh, address travel as we go forward, and we'll try to stay safe with the rest of the federal government and how they do it. Mm -hmm. And Rich, how's, how is Northrop looking at that? Yeah, thanks. And I mean, think uh, similar to what John said regarding how states are doing. I mean, we definitely um, halted our travel to mission critical business essential only and, and went through sort of a review process to just make sure that, our you know, we were doing that consistently. And for us, I mean, we follow the guidance in a lot of ways in terms of our customers. So um, as the customer has implemented, you know, restrictions on their sites and and, and travel, you know, in those ranks, it was, we just sort of followed that. Um, and that, that has been, I think, pretty well received by our employees. And again, the, our ability to work remotely and to drive collaboration, not only in the company, but with our supply chain and with our key partners has been, you know, really, it hasn't been too disruptive because, you know, sort of everybody's been following the same recipe, I would say. Mm -hmm. Here's another question uh, that just came in. Um, talking about at what point will testing of personnel be required or enforced uh, as we continue through the, the different phases of uh, reentry that are planned? And um, uh, maybe I'll go ahead and ask that to Janine. <laughs> you know, you gonna, are, you're a small company, but are you going to oh. require, would you require uh, uh, your employees to, to be tested? That's a really good Good question. Um, I'm trying to envision the circumstances that would require us to, to, to take such an action and then the related issues around protecting health information mm -hmm. and the impact with the ADA. Um, honestly, I, I can't envision a situation where we would require a blanket requirement for our employees to get tested. I certainly do know anecdotally that we have employees who are wanting that information for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they're not reporting it reporting it to us. I, I suppose I could imagine situationally, uh, you know, where there might have been some specific area of exposure, um, in which case we may support our employees in that regard. But I have a hard time coming up with a scenario for us as a company mm -hmm. where we would require um, testing of all of our employees. Okay. Or, uh, I'm curious, um, Rich, is, is Northrop looking at any types of requirements for its, em its employees? I mean, I think for us, we, you know, we don't have any um, policy or procedure around testing right now. And we, we would continue just to evaluate that based on the conditions locally and, and regionally, et cetera. Okay. Um, so here's another question. You know, we've talked about this a little bit, that there's so many factors um, beyond our own workplaces uh, that will affect an employee's ability to come back to work. And these things uh, include like the uh, schedule for uh, our kids and going to schools. Um, are they gonna be at home doing online learning? Uh, who's going to be home with them? Um, also, what about child care? If, if you need child care and is it available and is your child care facility open? Um, what if your 
you have a frail uh, elder in your family and um, you're taking care of them in your home and you're, there's health concerns or there's all types of uh, potential health concerns with family members, of course. How do you, um, those are just a few examples. How um, are you and your organization you know, positioned to uh, address an employee comes to you with um, uh, a request to accommodate, you know, some of these unpredictable variables. Uh, um, how are you? How are you addressing that? And uh, let's let's start with uh, John over uh, at State. Sure. Um, in INR, we've been uh, having this communication since since day one about addressing uh, anyone that's high risk. Um, we have a, a large part of our population that relies on needing child care to be available. So we had done a survey a few weeks ago, and um, luckily for us, we have a, a little about two thirds of our projects um, that people are working on can be shifted to those that um, cannot come into the office while, that are um, were being done by those that, that uh, were home before but are now coming in. And then additionally, um, we have over 90% of our office directors saying that they have the bandwidth to be able to do flexible scheduling, to do alternate hours, alternate days, so that if somebody that um, may be taking care of somebody at high risk but maybe needs to come into the office every couple of weeks or something, may be able to come in on that off day or on that weekend where there's very few people in the building to, to minimize their exposure to anyone. So we've really encouraged um, with our, our town halls and um, our other meetings that we've had is to encourage that dialogue and that communication so that that supervisor understands the expectation of who can come back when. And again, trying to promote as much telework and as much workforce flexibility as possible, that those folks would be among the, the last to be able to come back as we go to phase three. Um, so we, we kind of feel pretty good, especially some of, by the nature of what we do, some of our offices and our spaces are set up where people have individual offices or mm -hmm. can close doors and be kind of closed off from just a huge cube farm or something. So we, we, we're kind of lucky in, in that way that we can still address our, our employees' needs as well as our intelligence requirements. So that sounds like you're really trying to take the most flexible approach you can uh, to even the point where you're uh, changing uh, work roles or work duties, uh, shifting the work around uh, based on uh, what needs to be done and who's best suited. And uh, given our, our their leadership personal has situation. really encouraged that with our office directors and everything is, is to be as flexible as possible, but you know, just be able to get the mission done and they'll support it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Randy, are you are is NGA uh, looking at that type of flexibility? Is it it looks at you know you've we've all got mission. Everyone has mission to do. You got to get the mission done, especially the critical mission. Uh, is there a way you can look to um, uh, shift with uh, to accommodate uh, individual employees who may have some of these other concerns. We have and we are. And I fact was late to calling in today because I was on that topic with one of my division chiefs. It's an irony of sorts that the people who have been coming in to date, who have been coming in since the beginning at 12 percent and 25, will have to stop coming in at 50 and 75 because they are vulnerable. They're not vulnerable now because nobody's at work, but as people come in, they're going to stay home. Mm. So in St. Louis, as an example, these three or three, you know, like four top leaders all have issues that will cause them not to be able to come in. And we're coming up with plans to make that happen. Um, the childcare thing, working schedules, uh, maximizing telework. Basically, the admiral, the director of the agency has just said, Everybody do, you know, lean forward as far as possible to make things flexible for people. So, so you know, we, we are being flexible. We're still getting the job done. Um, and it's amazing how many folks you find out, you don't find out what's wrong, but have underlying issues. Mm -hmm. I guess it's that aging government workforce. So. so I know we talk about, in a way, I think we're getting to know our fellow uh, employees uh, in uh, uh, you know, more deeply uh, uh, than just in uh, what's what's going on in their personal lives uh, and not just what's going on at work has yes. been one of the outcomes so I think we're experiencing here through these these months of COVID. Um, 
Well, one thing about you know the maximum flexibility sort of gets back to this idea of of um, work from home, um, and uh, and that gets to the idea of of a dispersed workforce. So, um, have you know? Are you looking at the issue of a dispersed workforce? That well, we have a dispersed workforce right now, um, and what are the tools that they um, we would need to provide them to continue to to work, uh, 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 sort of work from home or telework? Um, and um, uh, are you you looking at that? And I'll I'll ask uh, perhaps ask uh, go back to Rich and ask uh, Rich to take a take a swipe at this one. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And I mean, as as I mentioned, you know, we have remained open, and we have obviously a pretty large workforce and a pretty geographically dispersed workforce. So um, we were able to scale pretty quickly in terms of moving some percentage of those folks to work remotely, and we had a lot of collaboration tools available at our disposal to enable that. And I think you know the key right now is really just sort of looking at that. Uh, we've gotten a lot of examples of what's worked at scale and maybe what hasn't worked. And so now we're going to refine our collaboration space to, you know, sustain where we need to be from a remote workforce perspective. Um, but, you know, it has, hasn't been really that disruptive because, you know, we had a fair amount of our workforce that was already enabled to work remotely. We just scaled it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe you, you were talking, Janine, um, also about most of your workforce being able to, to work rem remotely. Do they all have the tools they, they need? They do. They do. Um, everyone at at Plus Three is has a telework agreement in place. It's um, a part of our our regular policy. Um, we did um, take a look at all those policies, and for example, um, had a provision as you would expect um, in the you know before you know pre-COVID that you couldn't provide full time. Uh, dependent child care while while teleworking, right? Um, and so when when we looked at going fully remote for those that could, we went through all of our policies and and actually relieved a lot of those kinds of provisions at least through the end of the calendar year, so that that's all in place now. And and that includes you know folks splitting shifts. Mm -hmm. um, with someone else in the household so that, um, or even um, splitting, you know, two hours on, two hours off as they as they um, work with their um, school age children, um, those kinds of things. I mean, I think we, we have definitely have the tools for them to be effective and the policies to, to make it easy. But one thing I do wanna speak to when you mentioned about kind of dispersed workforce is um, one of the things we've worked really hard to do is kind of keep us knitted together, um, really trying to find ways. I mean, obviously we want folks to be effective, delivering against our requirements, ensuring that the missions that we're supporting, you know, get get the kind of support that they need. Um, and we wanna make sure that our folks don't feel like they're just all off disconnected, right? So we've put a ton of effort into um, creating kind of this um, friendly outreach, mm -hmm. lots of, um, we've, we've kicked off wellness toolkits. We've done, um, we do, you know, coffee breaks, 15 minutes, um, four times a week where people can just drop in. Um, we've really worked, our, we are, we live in Slack um, at Plus Three. And I have to say mm -hmm. that we have added what we kind of consider sort of the social channels, um, a DIY channel and a cooking channel. And we've really tried to use the tools um, that are there for workplace productivity um, mm -hmm. initially, but we've also tried to kind of expand their use so that we could really keep community together. And, and I would say that um, a lot of what we've done you know, are things we're going to carry forward. Whatever, whatever this looks like down the road, we have tried out some new things, and I'm, I'm sure many of my colleagues on this panel can say the same thing. We tried out things that are keepers, right? We're mm -hmm. going to be doing this going forward, regardless of other things that may kind of go back to normal. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited that we had this innovative time, you know, necessity being the mother of invention and all of that fun stuff. But um, I really think that um, 
you know, and talking to other colleagues, we've all taken advantage of, of the difficult situation and have tested and tried out new things that really are helping our employees be more effective and have better life balance, I mm -hmm. think. Well, I'm glad you mentioned wellness. And uh, I know personally, work-life balance has been always been a big issue I've been a proponent of. And I'm thinking you know, COVID puts, you know, it puts stresses on work-life balance that I don't think we've ever had to deal with before. Yeah. So we do have a question uh, in from uh, one of our listeners who says, do your organizations provide any additional support to your workforce that supports their emotional well-being during this stressful and unprecedented time? And um, I'll go back to to uh, Randy to see, you know, NGA. Um, we had a, uh, a really great uh, talk, by the way, with uh, Sue Cowite uh, a while ago, uh, and I think who's you know really talked about leadership um, through humility and some great things and wellness as well. Um, what's uh, going on at NGA uh, uh, to address sort of the the whole employee issue and how you provide that support uh, to keep your you know the work workers um, uh, able to do the mission? So there's a lot of communication at NGA. Uh, the director likes town halls. He does a weekly town hall, virtual town hall with our employees. Um, everybody has, was given access to WebEx as a part of this, um, along with, as I said, the cat card readers. The human development director does a session every Monday, so she'll go through all the OPM rules, the programs, the benefits, everything that's available out there. Uh, we do, we have, as a part of our structure, normally our insider threat uh, section, which mm -hmm. looks for insider threats, but uh, you know, they have a lot of uh, psychiatrists, psychologist types. So we do resiliency sessions, virtual resiliency sessions for people on request. So supervisors can request those sessions with the employees. And um, just in the whole person concept, we have provided during this time, all sorts of free uh, certification type opportunities, training opportunities, really push that. And, and in fact, our tracking, having people report the certifications achieved during this time, and then necessarily having have to be job related. But uh, yeah, I think we really, really kept engaged. I mean, well, you know, I'm an old army guy. We used to say, mm -hmm. you really know how your soldiers are doing. You've got to look them in the eye every day. We can't do that, obviously, in this situation. So we push the chain of supervision to stay engaged every day, every week, to know that folks are doing okay out there. And I've had several of my employees that have had the virus and recovered, and we, and we stay engaged on the phone. I could probably overdo it at times with all the leadership calling people. They probably get tired of the phone calls. So, so yeah, even though I'm an engineer, I'm, I'm, I'm learning to be a little touchy-feely here. So. <laughs> Appreciate that, Randy. And, Call me uh, anytime, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, um, you know, everyone has a different work-life uh, situation. So um, what are your thoughts about how you handle, this is a question from uh, one of our, our uh, listeners. What are the questions about how you handle sort of the category of us and thems? Uh, so you're going to have, for example, some people who may have dependent children and they've got a whole list of childcare issues and school at home issues and, and other things versus other employees who might have much greater flexibility. Maybe they don't have any kids, children at home uh, and they can you know, work harder, how, you know, well, over time, uh, that's, you know, uh, how do you handle the, the uh, this sort of question of the balance and, and us versus them? And um, maybe Rich, I'll, I'll ask you, I'm sure Northrop has, you know, like any yeah. large company, a comp entire span of, of uh, you know, situations. Uh, how do you address this? Yeah, so I mean, for us, it really comes down to, you know, at least and, and with communication, I mean, we have done an excellent job, you know, and I have to give credit to our communications department for at every level of our organization, across all our sites and all our functions, we have just communicated regularly and, and with that, though, to your question, though, comes a recognition that, you know, each employee situation is different potentially and we need to be agile. Um, there's a level of anxiety in one group that may not be in another, et cetera. But we have put a framework in place 
uh, to accommodate that. And again, regular communication at all levels in our organization, even at the manager to employee level, giving them the information about what resources are available um, to communicate to their employees. Um, as an example, we've, uh, you know, I'm sure all companies have these employee resource groups. Mm -hmm. We started another employee resource group that's just focused on how to work more effectively remotely. So that's just kind of an example of kind of an organic um, level reaction or mm -hmm. response to um, what's happening in our environment to maintain that level of communication and community to really keep our focus on safety and, as well as the mission. Hey, John, over at State Department, similar question to you than this idea of us uh, versus them and different people who have different um, requirements, if you will, on, on what they need to do outside of work and how that affects their ability to get to work during COVID. Um, how, do you, how do you address that? Right. Uh, we've actually addressed it a couple of times in some of our town halls. Our leadership has been really good about trying to knock down any us versus them by one team. You know, everybody that's coming into work, everybody that, that's trying to do the mission, everybody is looking to work together. So what we've been doing is those that have been working in a workplace and have a comfortable routine, um, just because you're nervous about, the, you know, the, the new folks coming into the office, they're just as nervous coming in to, to the office because they've been comfortable at home and their routine there. So the idea is communicating. What are the expectations mm -hmm. in your office when you come in? Um, you know, so that we're promoting that one team, one effort. If you're starting well, you know, we have a face mask policy and I'm not sure if I want uh, the cleaning crew to be able to come in because, you know, they're going through different parts of the building and we feel that they may put us at risk. But when they're coming in with their face mask on, while you're sitting at your desk, would you happen to have yours on? Because they're just as nervous coming into your space by by being at that risk so we've been really good about trying to explain to everyone the one team concept and to just focus on trying to do the mission and mm -hmm. communicate with everybody so if this is the expectation you know you're having a few more people coming back into the office let them know ahead of time hey this is kind of what we've worked out for a while and like i said one of the good things that we have is based on the spacing within our office uh our office spaces allows them the flexibility of going, okay, when you come in, this is how we're handling our space. And then, um, you know, just kind of passing that on. And then other folks within the building is everybody's here as one team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's another question um, about, you know, what if you, you find out that an employee or a vendor has actually uh, contracted COVID-19 and uh, you, you're, you're informed about that. Uh, what's your protocol to address that? What, what steps do you take um, uh, when you find that out, that somebody that's uh, you know, perhaps been in your work building uh, uh, has actually contracted the disease? You know, what, what do you do? Uh, Randy, why don't you, I, I ask for NGA, do you have a, uh, a protocol we, in place for that? Early on, uh, we set up uh, an incident response team, 24-7 uh, operation led by a senior executive that would receive all reports. We had to establish a protocol pretty quickly because people got super paranoid in the beginning and mm -hmm. the cleaning supplies uh, were very decision with cleaning supplies. So someone is reported to the IRT, either self-reports, you know, some matter we find out, the first step is we have our police force cordon off the area. And then we wait 24 hours for CDC guidance and we send our cleaning teams in to sanitize the area the employee worked in, the nearest uh, bathroom to the employee, the nearest pantry to the employee. So we do have a full protocol of what to clean. In the beginning, they wanted us cleaning whole sides of the building, but that was not sustainable. So we had to get a handle on and truly strictly follow CDC guidance. So the IRT does a good job. We do the contact tracing through our badges uh, so we can know. And when you log on to a computer at NGA, we know who could have been near that person just by the log on date. And we'll go back through to the IRT to notify anybody who may have had contact. So it's, it's gotten quite sophisticated uh, by necessity um, to, 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 to do what we needed to do and not overdo it. Answers the question because cleaning supplies 
I have the logistics division under me. We still are struggling to have sufficient supplies. We, for a while, were reporting cleaning supplies as I used to report rations or ammunition in the army mm -hmm. days of supply. And so we tell the director, we have 28 days of supply of hand sanitizer. So, uh, and we're still doing that because we're not uh, quite there yet with the supply chain. Yeah. So, well, hey, we have time for one last question. And then that'll, I'll just, uh, 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 for the last question, I'll just ask, is there anything about, you know, we've been doing so much telework in all of our organizations. Um, is there anything about the telework heavy environment uh, that has surprised you? And um, maybe I'll start with uh, Janine on that. So, um, so yes, I, I think that um, as a person who's kind of an in-person leader, someone who's always felt like um, I did better, you know, in person, one-on-one -on -one or, or with a group, um, I've been very um, just so delighted at how much true collaboration and connection can be built um, in a virtual space. I've had two people join my team during this, mm -hmm. this remote work time, um, and they, you know, both the way that um, our our team has has embraced them and the way that they've kind of leaned in and 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 gotten involved and um, really accelerated their their integration and and um, and coming up to speed and just feeling connected, right, mm -hmm. has been just remarkable. We have had, and, and it hasn't just been my team, the, the corporate team, so many grassroots initiatives of engineers on various programs launching, you know, happy hours and mm -hmm. coffee breaks and Slack channels um, to stay connected with the broader company. Um, I've just been just really so, grat it's been so gratifying our employee population has really stepped up and wanted to stay connected and has done, put their own effort into making that happen. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really very hopeful about what the future looks like, that even if we are stay in a very dispersed type environment, that our culture um, has, has flourished and has taken on kind of some new facets and it's very exciting when I think about how we can build on this in the future. Well, thank you for that response. And I think that's gonna be our last uh, our response for today. And I'll just say, you know, it does come down, I guess, to, um, you know, communications and, and staying in touch with, uh, you know, the people we work with each day and doing the most we can to address all their concerns and really approach us with a team effort across the workplace. And, um, that wraps up our time. And I wanna thank each of the panelists again for your time this afternoon. And Suzanne, I will turn it back over to you for a few closing comments. Thank you. Thanks, John. Great. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. And how delighted I am to have you as part of the team and to moderate this discussion today. And also want to thank our panelists for going through um, a dry run or two so we could get as close to perfection as we could for today's program. And for all of those of you who have um, tuned in today, I'd also like to thank Guide Health and ServiceNow for your support today um, of our programming. And just a couple of events I wanted to highlight um, for our virtual attendees that we have coming up. Um, next week on June 23rd, we are hosting Julian Galena, um, the CIO of CIA. And then the next day in the afternoon, we are hosting Suzanne White. And on July 1st, we'll be hosting Isabel Petalunas. So we have a full lineup of IC um, luminaries coming up over the next several weeks. Um, and then as a reminder, um, we are taking our event, the new IC Empowering Women and Engaging Men virtual. It's going to be spread out over a week. So every day will be an hour of programming versus trying to accomplish it all in one day. Um, would encourage you all to join us for that. 
our diversity and inclusion panel um, that Thursday is gratis for all to attend. So would um, encourage those to register for the whole week as well as join us for that day's conversation. And you can find the full lineup of speakers um, on our website. So this conducts uh, today's programming. I know I learned a lot and really appreciate our panelists engaging and giving us insights into how their organizations are operating during this new normal. Thanks again. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.